Theater, um, and thanks so much for joining us for a conversation with Anne Bogart. Um, I have a couple of announcements about technology uh, to touch upon first. Uh, this event is being live streamed on HowlRound TV, so hello to folks out there who may be watching us from afar. Um, you can follow the conversation on Twitter at ATLouisville using the hashtag Humanifest, um, and there will be an opportunity for questions. Um, a little bit later on. Uh, so if you have something to say, make sure you um, wave your hand and wait for somebody to run a microphone to you, because uh, this auditorium is large enough that we want to make sure everybody can hear you, and also um, the folks who are uh, watching out in cyberspace as well. Um, so with those logistics down, um, we're gathered this morning to listen to an amazing artist in conversation with another amazing artist. Um, Les Waters, Actors Theater's Artistic Director, is facilitating this chat. Um, he's also the director of Lucas Nace, The Christians, in this festival. Um, and it made perfect sense to feature Anne uh, this year, who probably most of you know is an um, incredible director 
the co-artistic director of City Company. Um, and she's one of the American Theater's great teachers. She runs the graduate directing program at Columbia University. Um, and she's also the author of five books. Um, the most recent is titled, What's the Story? Essays about art, theater, and storytelling. And it's being released by Rutledge later this year. Um, I'll also just quickly add that Anne and City Company have been a really wonderful part of this organization's history. Uh, in her work in both the subscription season and the Humana Festival um, has been, uh, it spans more than two decades. And this year she's the director of Steel Hammer and the Victor Jory. Um, and finally, in a much sort of broader landscape, City's impact on the art form has been huge. Not only um, the pieces that they've created, but the company's trained several generations of theater artists in Viewpoints and Suzuki. Um, so that's probably enough of a preface, and I'm just going to turn the floor over to Les. Cool. Um, hi, everybody. This, uh, this is my friend, Ben Bogart. Um, Anna and I have known each other since uh, 1999, when I was here doing Big Love, and Anne was working on War of the Worlds. I think that's correct. Uh, we met. That, if you go through that door to the left, and smart smoking. <laughs> uh, Anne is much wiser than me and has given up. And it's on. Um, ish. Um, so, uh, we thought this is a very informal conversation between the two of us. Um, Anne is somebody I admire very, very much, and I think um, Steel Hammer. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of theatre over many years, and it's it's up there in my top ten of. Uh, I think it's uh, one of my favourite productions ever. I think it's genius, and I'm really thrilled you're here uh, to be part of the. It's not the 50th anniversary of the Human, it's the 38th, but this is our 50th anniversary. So I'm great. Um, we thought we'd just talk very casually about uh, what we're interested in now, and you have Steel Hammer and the new book coming up, so um, let's talk a little about the book and what, it, what its focus is. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. I'm happy to be with you this morning on a rainy morning in Louisville, Kentucky. And you can tell that the Les and I don't get along because we dress so differently. <laughs> If I could grow a beard, <laughs> I might just do that. <laughs> anyway, so it's 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 thrilling to be here, and, and also in this particular building, what is it called again? Um, when buildings remember, they have history. Uh, I, I think it's called. There's a British scientist philosopher um, uh, called Rupert Sheldrake. Who, who has a theory of something called morphic resonance, which I'm probably um, uh, mangling what the theory is. Uh, morphic resonance, part of morphic resonance is that in, uh, buildings can have memory, or, the, or the, there's some uh, inanimate things um, retain the memory of people who pass through them. I suppose that it's kind of loosest, trickiest things that you would what? Loosest, trickiest thing that you would think is tricks. Huh? The sixties. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, what was the first part? What? Loopy. Oh, loopy trips. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so scary. No, we just go into a building and think, well, this, some things happened in this building. I, I think uh, actors can identify it in spaces when they walk into something and it feels that the space is alive. Uh, so that's that's a quick canter through part of morphic resonance. We're going to spend the next hour on morphic resonance, but but th this room and the other theaters in this building all for me hold amazing memories and. The fact that you share it with audiences, that you share a production, what does that mean, you know, in a room? I love, I love how uh, comics, you know, stand-up comics, they'll be in Vegas or something, they'll say, it was a good room. And the, the room they're talking about is like a 4,000 seat house or something. The idea of a room being a good room. This room is a good room. Yep. And there's something um, 
about the relationship between the audience. Don't you feel like you own the stage as you sit on the audience? Wait, what are we talking about? Oh, we're talking about the new book. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I've written a new book called What's the Story? And it's coming out in uh, this month, uh, April, April 20th. It's, it's a month ahead of time. Have you ever heard of a book being a month ahead of time? It's a month ahead of time. And it, um, it's a continuation of a series of books of essays that I've written. One is called A Director Prepares, another is called And Then You Act, and this is What's the Story? Written about the idea of telling stories now and what it means. And I'm a child of postmodernism. I was brought up to deconstruct. Everything that I got as a director, I took apart. And I took it apart and took it apart and took it apart. <coughs> I couldn't do a classic play without taking it apart. And the notion of postmodernism is if you imagine that, that all the parts of a play are like blocks, so there's a text block and a life block and an emotion block and a structural block and a phenomenological block and a meaning block. What the, what the postmodernists did is they basically tipped the blocks over so they all were lying horizontally on the ground. And so you could pick up text and say, oh, text, well, that's no more important than, I'm sorry, playwrights, um, it's no more important than the, the, uh, the, the way meaning is made. This is no more important than the way the light falls on a hand, if you see what I mean. And then you rearrange the blocks, and that was called postmodern so <laughs> deconstruction. And I believe that we've reached the end of postmodernism, and that we've deconstructed to a place where nothing means anything. And in the rediscovery of meaning, we have to ask, how do we, we create, as human beings, meaning through stories? And so we ask now, whose stories do we tell? For whom? And how do we tell them? And this question, I think, lies at the heart of something that doesn't have a name yet, that is not postmodernism, but is the next ism that somebody was come along in name at some point. And this question has been at the heart of, um, of my thinking in the last uh, few years, which is, again, whose stories do we tell? There are pioneers in this, uh, in the theater. I mean, certainly uh, the work of Anna DeVere Smith or the civilians or uh, Tony Kushner in his own funky way, Emily Mann. They're all saying, whose stories are we telling and how do we tell them and for whom? So this is a book that actually goes back to ask, what is the role of stories for theater? How do stories work on a neurological sense in terms of neuroscience? And then I also use stories from my own life because I've always found the best way to teach is to actually describe how I learned it. In other words, if I just describe a theory about something, it's not interesting because the only way that anybody remembers anything is through emotion. And that stories actually create bonds between people through the empathic emotions that are created through stories. So this is a book about that, Mr. Liz. Yeah. <laughs> and still hearing April 20th. And Steel Hammer, it also is a story that I thought when you asked that question, a story about whom, for whom, and why are you telling the stories? This is, for those who haven't seen it yet, Steel Hammer is based around the story of John Henry, the John Henry story about a man who went into a contest against a machine, won and died. Um, a, the story of an African-American man who went through this, uh, I think in the telling of the story makes the themes and him visible and hearable. But also, um, it, 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 I, I thought working on a play, is this the question you were gonna ask me? <laughs> <laughs> it was about the power of a story through songs and, and, and how a story was carried through time and appropriated by different cultures was an interesting, an, an, an interesting way to go. You know, the, 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 um, the issue of stories, the John Henry story, the notion of visibility, uh, I'm thinking of two things. I'm thinking of, uh, 
I read something about the Tasmanians, you know, that little island off of Australia. They say that stories are the only way that, that keeps them from falling off the edge of the earth. They're way down there. Nobody remembers them that stories do that. And then I was, I was listening to um, Terry Gross on, uh, on, on Fresh Air, NPR, and she was interviewing a man who was um, an, an expert in, in post-Civil War reconstruction. And she it was interviewing him because she had seen 12 Years a Slave and was so knocked out by the movie that she wanted to pursue it on her radio program. And at one point she asked the man, why this story? Why 12 Years a Slave? And the answer was, because there's hardly any stories that have survived of that time, of the African American experience, for reasons that are political, the fact that people couldn't write, or weren't allowed to write, that these stories were carried down, and so it's not that there's a lot of stories to choose from. So the notion of a story creating visibility, or communities becoming visible through story, hence the cho choice of, of Steel Hammer. Mm -hmm. But shall I tell you a little bit more about how Steel Hammer Sure. Yes, do is, um, <laughs> is, um, For those who have seen Steel Hammer, for those who haven't, you, you, you may know that it's based on an oratorio, a big piece of ambitious postmodernist music written by Julia Wolf. And Julia Wolf is one of three composers who were classically trained. Uh, Julia Wolf is, is, is uh, married to Michael Gordon, and he's another composer, and David Lang. They were all uh, 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 classically trained composers. And as, as, as young people, they decided that no orchestras would actually play their music because orchestras, because what they were doing was very funky kind of new music. So they formed their own band, and it's called the Bang on the Can All-Stars, which is a very smart thing for these young people to do, have done 30 years ago, is they thought, well, nobody's going to play our music, so we'll get a band together of really fantastic uh, 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 musicians who, who play their music. Julia <coughs> had written a piece uh, called Steel Hammer about John Henry, and she was looking to turn it into a theater piece. And she went to visit um, Joe Melillo, uh, uh, who runs Brooklyn Academy of Music, who said, oh yeah, you should talk to Anne at City Company. They could help you make it into a theater piece. So, so uh, the two of us met in uh, Le saint uh, a, a, a restaurant on 7th Avenue and 19th Street, something like that. Yeah. And, um, and she proposed it, and immediately, even before I heard the music, I'm, embarrassed to say, I heard Julie's music. I said, this is fantastic. The first thing I thought was the Bang on the Can all-star musicians together with city company actors. The idea of two communities of different disciplines who come together on the same stage would be fan bloody fantastic. Secondly, the idea of a, of a piece about John Henry. Again, whose stories do we tell? Who do they belong to? And why are they telling them? Um, and, and, and this seemed like a fantastic idea. When I listened to the piece, and for those who have seen it, it's a challenging piece of music. I will say the more exposure you have to it, the more glorious and deep and uh, what an amazing journey this piece of music is. So I hope that those who listen to it once, it's actually coming out on a CD like about right now. You can get it on iTunes, I think. Um, it's, it's actually a glorious piece of music, but to create a dramatic framework for this piece of music, um, I wanted to ask for African American playwrights to actually tell their own versions. Is Kia in the room? I knew you were supposed to be here. Hi, Kia. There's one of them right there. I didn't see, I didn't see you before. Kia is one of the four amazing playwrights, and you're going to see it for the first time this afternoon. I hope you like it. <laughs> it's fantastic. It is fantastic. You'll know Kia's piece because it's the first play in the piece. So we, we, did, we don't in the program say, it's hard to say, okay, after this piece of music, then this is Kia's piece. Anyway, it's the first play that's in, in the order of the piece. Where am I going with this? Oh, so I asked four playwrights, each to write their version of the John Henry story. I told him a little bit, like I told Kia, and she really ran with it. I said, oh, it's going to be in a kind of tent show atmosphere. And Kia, you went right there, didn't you? You really wrote a, wrote a beautiful play for a tent show. 
Um, but I said, don't talk to each other. So Kia Corthren, Will Power, Regina Taylor, and Carl Hancock Brooks, I said, don't talk to each other about it. Just write what you want to be heard and seen about the John, John Henry story. And each of them sent very distinct short plays back. And um, I find that they miraculously go together. You'll, you'll make that decision, Kia, this afternoon when you see it. Oh, it moved. It's coming right up. Yeah. Uh, so taking these four <coughs> plays and this very ambitious oratorio music and putting them together was the task. And here we are. Cool. So, and the whole storytelling thing, I mean, I've always been interested in it because I, I'm basically... You tell stories really I tell, well. well, I do, I think. <laughs> and I'm also rural working class um, and sort of written out of history. I mean, there was no narrative to my parents' lives, so I um, seemed very important to me as a young guy that those voices... But your father was also a steel worker. Well, my dad, yeah, my mum's family are rural, and, and farm workers, and my father worked in a steel mill, uh, which was the only industry really in this agricultural area. So uh, steel and hammer is uh, profoundly moving to me, because um, I, I find it as magnificent and as awful in the proper sense, um, unendurable as my father's life was, but the, the, and, and the story, um, yeah, I've always had a, 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 it was driven, I think, by fury as a young man, that um, working class voices, particularly agricultural, agrarian workers' voices were not heard on the stage, or they were a joke, you know, or, or there were two myths, one you were stupid, um, and that, you know, goes back to restoration drama or Shakespeare, that, you know, these people are idiots, or, or, or the, a particularly evil myth that I think is that if you work on the land, it puts you in touch with nature, <laughs> um, <coughs> which it does, and it kills you, and it's awful. So, I, I mean, this claiming of stories, I mean, so how do you think this is going to affect the future of the company, where you go with the work? Is this going to be to the forefront of your feet in thinking about the, the work your company makes, the, the, how you teach? Well, first of all, I, I'm so interested in the word choice you used, which was fury. Would you say you were your father or you were filled with fury? I think um, I was filled with fury. My, um, my, there's a, I don't know if this term exists here in this country. In, in England, there's a term called death, which is applied really to agricultural workers, that you're a deferential worker, that you bow down to the boss. Um, and my parents were classic examples of this. You know, like my, my, my mother, who was ill a lot of my childhood, wouldn't go to the doctor because she didn't want to take up his time. Because he was middle class and busy. So I, I think my own work for a while, although it ships, of course it does, put it, and, and is now somewhere else, uh, I think a lot to do with my biology and my age. Um, but I think a lot of the work was originally driven by real fury and rage and things like you. Um, and I was part of a generation of English theatre artists who were transformed by an educational act in 1947, which would get us all to college. And, and a, a, a lot of us saying, you know, like, listen to us. And I think theatre is a particularly middle class profession. Yeah, it was fuel. You know, I, I, I wonder a lot about fuel, and, and I'll get to your question, and, and what creates a career? What, what is it that makes you keep going after lousy reviews, not raising money, not, chance, not having chances, feeling invisible? And I feel that fury or anger is a common denominator. And I would say, I also, I, I, sometimes I joke, and it's actually not a joke, as Freud would tell us, 
that it's uh, the, the first half of my career was based on anger against my parents, and the second half of my career was based on anger against the critics. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a kind of revenge and anger and fury that I relate to, and that in a way is my secret. And I don't have to share it. It's very useful. And when I'm having a hard time, it, it, it gets me through the hard, the hard moments. But to answer your question, um, our adventure with Steel Hammer has just begun. Because when, in starting this project, as I mentioned, there's the Bang on the Can all-star band. And then there's these four plays. There's the integration, there's the creation of the theatrical context in which Steel Hammer now happens. It was very clear to me that we couldn't start with the band. In other words, and those of us who have been in rehearsals would know it would be a horrible thing for the, for the musicians to sit around waiting for us to figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to work on these plays together. <laughs> so talking to Les about coming here to work on Steel Hammer, I said, I really would like to be in the VJ because it's a, it's a protected environment. It's a beautiful jewel of a theater upstairs for those of you who've been there. It's a small theater, and it, we can be there from day one of rehearsal in that room. And talking about a, a room having history, I've made a number of plays in that room, and they carry, they carry the memory of each other. So this, this first phase of working on Steel Hammer, which you're, I'm so excited to share with you, is without the band. The big next step, which it will be truly transformational, is to actually work in, on a big stage with the band, with three singers, who are Norwegian, by the way, three Norwegian singers who have no vibrato. That's a funny thing about modern composers, they don't like vibrato, you know? Most opera singers, are, their careers are based on their vibrato. These three singers have none. It's just this straight sound. <coughs> Modern composers seem to like a lot. Anyway, so uh, uh, the next big phase is to actually get together with these considerable artists who are the musicians of the Bang on the Can, the medieval, medieval trio, uh, which is the Norwegian singers, and the actors, and start to see what happens. Because Julia Wolf, who came last week to see the show, and thank God she was delighted. I sat there, as did Christian Fredrickson, the music director, we sat, we sat there the entire time saying, she hates it, she's going to say, you can't do this, <laughs> take my music away. You know, during the show, we were convinced she would just say, you can't do this with my music. But she was absolutely delighted. She kept saying, oh, you'll see, it'll be so different with the musicians, because they can stretch this out, and, and how, how the, the one musician could be actually in the center of the actors in a particular uh, clogging sequence. Yes, I just gave away the big secret. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so to answer your question, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, adventures lie ahead. And, um, uh, uh, but already working on this piece has, has altered my DNA. What, does it do that? You can't alter your DNA. No. <laughs> has changed the way I think about the theater. <laughs> For one thing, and I'll just say this, uh, in rehearsing this play, um, I realized as we're working that most of what the actors are doing actually has to be what the actors are doing and not acting what the actors are doing. For example, is it giving away a section to say that the actors run for a really long time? <laughs> they run for a really long time in a circle. Okay, I've given away another secret of the play. Yes. Um, and <laughs> as we started to work on it, you know, it's hard to do, but the actors would sometimes try to act the relationships of the play as they're running before they got too tired. And I just kept saying to them, no, just run. The audience will bring their own associations about how it feels to do a marathon in your own life, to get the, the, this particular job done overnight when you stay up all night, to, to, to you know, what they call it in, in, in architecture, a charrette, where you're up all night getting something finished. This is a kind of charrette. Don't act. 
act, just do. It's true also with, okay, I gave it away, the clogging section. <laughs> Don't act on top of it, just be. I've never said that, Lily. I'm a big believer in acting. <laughs> but a lot of this play is, is being more than acting. Okay, I said it. Well, no, I think that's what I do. Mean. So, <coughs> I think that's a huge shift. Yes. I, I mean, I, I, um, I mean, I'm not one who would ever attempt to talk about trends in theater or performance, but I do kind of think that that's a kind of pretty major shift going on. I mean, I, I'm particularly fond of like a, a, an English theater group, Forced Entertainment, who will do 24-hour pieces, 12 hours. Um, you, like ex you like extreme things, don't you? I don't know if I, I yes, do I? I mean, I, um, they don't, they just seem normal to, to me. I mean, they seem to me to be what life looks like at a certain point in my life. But in but a way, I, in a way, not to give away the Christians, you, you're doing that too. It is what it, I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> it so is what it is. <laughs> And you, you're and really, you're really flirting with a dangerous context with Christians. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, do you think this is a genuine shift going on, or, or I, I think my work, my, I, I could say my DNA as a director shifted after doing Our Town here earlier this year, which was a, am, am I a, a bit sus? wary of saying how it shifted because I like to obscure things for myself and not have it very clear but something seismic went on in that about let, just letting things happen which I think is the same thing. Do you think this is in the air? I, it's dangerous to say it, it is becoming this because we as human beings too easily methodize things. The minute we see an answer, we say, oh, that's how it's done. That's what's always worried me about, say, the viewpoints. Because I said, what is the viewpoints approach to making theater? No, no, that's not going to solve any problems for you. It's a way of training to stay open to the moment, one could say. So I, I think it's a little bit dangerous to say this is the new way theater is going to be done. What I do think is one has to do, and I bet you're doing it, and it's, in, in City Company, it, what I'm about to say sounds great, but it can be really annoying, and, and it's very important, is whenever we find the answer to a scene, somebody will say, but what is it really? <laughs> we have what the technique, our technique, if we have one, we use the what is it, what is it really technique, which is endless because just when you think you have something, you have to then say, what is it? Oh, it's this, but what is it really? And that can be so annoying because if I say, well, the trend is that we now are uh, uh, scraping away pretense in the uh, presentation of a, of a play. Fine, but what is it really? And then it starts to get interesting. So I hope we would never stop asking that annoying and irritating question. Good. Um, um, <laughs> I'm going to open this up a bit. Um, has anybody got any annoying and irritating questions? <laughs> Somebody in there? Yeah.
Hammer? Are you? Oh, there you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, to me, it's being hammered all the time about him being trapped uh -huh. in a very, very unjust situation. But I had a problem. There was two R's, and the parts were not connected. You lost me every time when it got into like the marathon. Now that you said that, I thought, oh yeah. I don't want to be handheld as an audience member, but I would like not to be lost completely through a production. And I don't know how that can be done. I don't know, maybe you uh, give away, you know, you're saying you give away secrets, but to me that broadens the experience if I had known about the, the marathon as far as the, the, the going around and around and around. I, 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 if you understand what I'm saying, how can a play not lose an audience members when especially there's different, totally different segments in it? You know, you know I, I think actually it's a great question, and I'm going to seem ingenuous in saying this, but I think that all great questions have exactly the same answer. And your question is great, which is how can a play not lose an audience? How can the second? And the answer is exactly. That's the problem. And I'm interested in the fact that you say when you hear the, the context of it, you say, oh, and then maybe you would look at it differently. And I, I'm constantly wondering how to bring an audience into the uh, uh, the creative, how to allow an audience to be creative in the process of watching the play. And I do think that the play offers that, but it seems like one needs help, is what you're saying. And uh, I respect that. That's 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 a big issue. And and uh, you know we did a. A project here in, I think it was in the late 90s, City Company, and it was called The Audience Project. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if anybody in this room was involved in <coughs> Oh, Dan, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it was funded by the Pew Charitable Trust. And I was interested in that exact question about how an audience can be brought into closer relationship to a play, especially if it's challenging or what have you. So we got together, how many people was it, Jan? It was like 60? Some of uh, focusers. Yeah. We got like 60 people together who agreed to sit in on at least two rehearsals of the play that we would do here in the panel ground, who would agree to write journal entries based on their experiences, who would sit in on one tech, see at least one performance, and be part of a talk back like this with an audience. What happened was an extraordinary thing, and I still think about it all the time in terms of your question. So we thought, and then these 60 people were from all different backgrounds, people who've gone to theater a lot, people who've never gone to the theater, people, young kids, high school people, older people, different religions, like all kinds of different. And we started all kinds of different. Is that <laughs> all kinds of different. We started with, I gave a lecture on what I thought was about the audience relationship to actors. And uh, so we set, up, we set up two banks of seating in the rehearsal, uh, on the fifth floor across the way in the rehearsal room. On either side, so you have stage management, you have sound design, you have director. And then on two wings, we had seats set up for the audience. This was the, the control group, it's a terrible word, but, and so they had promised to come twice. And they were told they couldn't, they had to come in during breaks and they couldn't eat during rehearsals. Well, the first day was terrifying because people came and, and, and the actors got really upset. They said, well, what are we supposed to do? You know, a rehearsal for us is a private moment where we're supposed to work with our pants down, we're supposed to make mistakes. So am I supposed to make, and we were doing Noel Cower's Hay Fever. <laughs> and they said, uh, 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 no, it was private life. It was a private life, right. And um, we did two Cower plays here. So, so, uh, so and after the first rehearsal, the actor said, we have to talk, as city company actors do. I'll see you at the bar. <laughs> at the bar. And they said, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to entertain them? If they laugh, does that mean we're doing well? And I, I realized in that moment it was already worth it, this two-year project, by that moment, because I realized, I said, no, I'm the litmus paper. 
you perform for me, my response matters. At a certain moment, it opens up to an audience and I share my experience with an audience, but you can't aim it everywhere. Um, uh, if you want, I can get really gross with a litmus paper um, um, uh, analogy, but I'll save that. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, so, so after a while, the, the actors got used to it and even started liking having the civilians come in, as we call them. And the civilians, to a large extent, loved coming to rehearsal and loved hearing about what we were trying to do, and then I would hear them in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the green room during breaks, they'd say, Stephen Weber's having a down day today. <laughs> <laughs> and then, amazingly enough, they, they wrote journal entries and then we had a talk back like this after a number of productions. The word that came up the most when I asked them what, what, how it affected them seeing a performance after sitting in on rehearsal was the word ownership. They said they felt an ownership in what was going on. It's very moving. I mean, you hear that more in sports, right? Somebody's having a down day, he'll get up tomorrow, you know, whatever that is. And that, that relationship, and the, the following year we made a play about these audience members called, called Cabin Pressure. It was about the relationship between the audience and the actor. And your question to me is absolutely key and pivotal, which is, my interest as a director is for you to have a rich experience. And as I said to a friend of mine who's here, uh, Rich Pinsky, I said to him today, I said, you gotta give over this play. Just hang out with it. Let it, let it, see if you can find a way in. And uh, because it is a demanding play. It's not, I mean, you've seen a lot of work. You know how to relate to it. It's not easy. It's not an easy play to relate to. And yet I believe that it has, <coughs> It, it has a, it proposes maybe a different way of telling the story, but it's tricky. So I take your question very seriously and, um, and, and wish to find ways to contextualize the work for audiences. So thank you. Um, I, I did see Still Hammer earlier this week, so I you can speak to that. I have one question about that and then a practical question. So how much, is your intention of the piece with the combination of the music, the text, and your direction going to fulfill that once the band is present? Um, and where can we see that? Uh, it can um, fulfill it, meaning fulfill what? I, I feel like if we saw the bang on the can players in the room, yep. it would have filled those spaces. Uh -huh. and, and, right, that's probably true. And I think you've even said it, that when that happens, it's going to make it this yep. even more all-inclusive thing. And I wonder if that's really how the piece is really meant to be presented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and where, where can we see it? <laughs> yeah, I think it is absolutely meant to be done with the band. And I think those who will see it later this weekend will see that. Although, I think you could also understand that it would be impossible to make this play with a band present, right? Um, I find this CD absolutely wonderful. <laughs> and wonderful lot, right? And, and listening to it maybe ahead of time would even help. Um, I'm not at liberty to say where it's going to be, but it will be. And, and you can find more information on the City Company's website. <laughs> I'm just not at liberty to say. But you will see it, and because um, it hasn't been announced. so. I promise you. <laughs> I uh, saw Steel Hammers last night and I have to agree with Mr. Waters that it was an amazing piece of theater. Um, but it was interesting, um, I'd say 10 to 12 people walked out. Uh, at the end of the show, though, the rest of the audience was on their feet. So it was really interesting seeing the the effect it had on the audience. You could look around at the audience members and see some of them with the what the hell is going on type of look on their face. And those were, some of those people walked out. And yet the rest of us that stuck around to the end, I think we're pretty much blown away. I guess my question to Anne would be, when you put together a show like Steel Hammers, do you, <laughs> how much do you consciously set out to push the boundaries? Uh, and, and make people uncomfortable. Is this something that just happens, or do you say, 
gee, we, we want to bother a few people, we want to push the edge. Well, this is going to be a long answer, so you might have to shut down the house here. Um, my first experience in the theater, when I was 15 years old, I was also the benefit of a federal program where I was brought in a school bus to Providence, Rhode Island. I was 15 and I saw the Scottish play uh, with the Trinity Repertory Company directed by Adrian Hall, the great Adrian Hall. And it was the first play I ever saw professionally, a professional play. And I sat in the audience and I was absolutely stunned because I didn't understand a word. Because it was Shakespeare, I'd never seen Shakespeare. I was brought up on Disney movies, the Navy, Disney movies, same thing. Um, <laughs> And uh, there was witches coming out of the ceiling. It was a set by Eugene Lee, who is known for still making the Saturday Night Live sets anyway. Uh, and, and, uh, this incredibly complicated production. And it was that day that I decided to become a theater director. And I, 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 I lear learned my first lesson from Adrian Hall. I didn't meet him until 25 years later, or 20 years later. And the lesson was, he taught me as a director is don't talk down to your audience. That it's not about understanding. That at the age of 15, I had to take every experience I've had up until that moment and use it to try and meet this thing coming at me, which I did not understand. And it changed me forever. And I can never live that lesson down, which is to try to speak from the complexity of whatever my own life experience is as a director, as a theater artist, as a, as a company. I've been with the company for 20 years, so it's really a collective issue, is that we try to make work that feels true and that feels communicative, that feels, yes, challenging. Um, it, it is not fun when people walk out. I feel bad, personally. I feel like, oh, just give it a chance. Hang in there. <laughs> and it, it's, um, it's disappointing, but I cannot work differently. I cannot speak down, meaning, meaning uh, I cannot, uh, what is it that Lillian Hellman said to the House on American Activities? I cannot cut my conscience to fit the something <coughs> <of> the day. <laughs> so, now hang on for a second. So, but I would propose to you that our approach to theater is not so radical. Um, the first time I saw the work of Ivo von Bova, does anybody know the director Ivo von Bova? He's a, 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 a he's, yes, he's a, a Dutch director, um, and he came to work at New York Theater Workshop the first time, it was in the 90s, I think. It was the first production I saw of his. And he did More Stately Mansions by, um, uh, by Eugene O'Neill, an un impossible play. Too long, impossible to understand, and this was the first time I'd seen his work. And um, the way it happened started, did you see it? No. And these five or six actors walk on stage, they bow to the audience, they bow to each other. The, uh, all except one walk to either side of the stage, they sit on folding chairs. Joan McIntosh, great American actress, inhales on stage and starts to speak at top speed the first eight page monologue of this Eugene O'Neill play. Top speed. And I went, oh my god. <laughs> and I'm sitting there trying to follow and, and shaking. And I start to hear this familiar sound that goes like thump, 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 thump. People leaving. Thump, thump. In the first 10 minutes, I would say a third of the audience left. <laughs> leaving in droves. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I, and I was on the edge of the seat, my seat. The rest of the audience that stayed for the five hour production, thank you very much, <laughs> were transformed by it. Now, when I thought about this afterwards, I thought I could never do that. And then I had to say, what do you mean, Anne? You could never do that. Well, as Americans, we are populist. So what we say as Americans is we say, okay, we're gonna be really nice in the beginning, get everybody seduced in the middle, we're gonna give up. <laughs> Hello, 
This is what's expected. This is how you participate. What any audience is doing when they come into the, uh, a theater, you come into this theater tonight to see the Christians tonight? No. Brownsville. Brownsville. You'll say, you'll say, as an audience, so Christians today, what are the rules? What am I supposed to do? You hear it in laughter, for example. You can tell if it's a ha 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 play or a ha 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 play or a silent play within the first few minutes. What Eva von Hoppe was doing, which not many Americans could do, and I still can't do, is saying, if you want to stay here for five hours, this is what's expected of you. In the first five minutes of the play. So one thing that we don't understand is how that negotiation happens between an audience and the actors in the very opening of a play. So there's a responsibility to that. I'm trying as an artist to be more honest. We actually, you saw an early version of uh, when we did our, uh, it was a pre-tech rehearsal, we did a run through. We had a whole scene in the beginning of, of, uh, 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 of Steel Hammer that was really meant to have the audience feel more comfortable and it was sort of like, oh, well, let's tell you about the story of John Henry. And it was a whole dialogue that um, Kia did not write. It was <laughs> put together from various sources. We cut it because it wasn't honest. And I actually made a joke. We did a run through, and I said, we need that beginning. I'm not Dutch, they said. <laughs> I actually am. The boat car cover is a Dutch game. <laughs> I now forgot the question I asked. <laughs> How much do you try to push the boundary when you, when you oh, show it together? So I try to push my own boundaries, and I trust that the audience will go with me. And you can call that the super big ego or no ego, I don't know which one. I assume that there's enough people who would share what thrills me. And if I betray what thrills me, I betray everybody. Each one had to actually be able to also play Medea. 
because you know even the third manicures from the left should have that kind of Medea quality, even though they're wearing fabulous gowns. I'm getting to answer your question, I promise. The first was a really a, pro, a production I was really proud of. On the uh, second preview, we all know how horrible second previews are, right? This horrible thing happened in this mall, which was nothing happened. The audience sat there, the actresses acted their asses off. This was in 1992. It was incredible production, and everybody <coughs> sat there like this. Like, there was no, no there there, as Gertrude Stein said about Oakland, California. There was nothing happening. And I left that night on a plane I was going to, I had to leave and come back. As it turned out, the rest of the run was fine, audiences were fantastic. It was a second preview, it was one of those horrible second previews. But when I was on the plane that night, taking a red eye, I thought, I can't direct in malls anymore. <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and I was just starting City Company at this time with Tadashi Suzuki. I said, I'm going to go to live in Saratoga Springs and people are going to have to make pilgrimages to see my play. My plays, you know. And then, of course, this word came into my head as an American. I thought, elitist. <laughs> I thought, no, but, you know, people are going to have to. My audience, my audience, this, my audience, that. <coughs> what I learned in a way that I won't take so long saying over a lot of, of, of experience and thinking is that you don't have an audience and you don't direct for an audience. That's the wrong way to think. You direct for a particular part of every audience. So when you go to see a play, there is a particular part of you that is being spoken to. So I never will, and since I've come to understand this, I don't think this is for a certain kind of people. I say this is a play that speaks to a certain part of the human experience. This particular play, Steel Hammer, requires an audience to do something with endurance, because the play is about endurance. It's about work. It's about the kind of work that kills you. But, and yet you, you love it, it feeds you, and then it kills you. I think we're all on the verge of dying from our jobs. <laughs> Overwork, it's a subject. So in my mind, it was directed for a certain part of every person who can come in. I, I don't know in terms of age how old you'd have to be to actually access that part of you. I think an exposure to work would help so that you actually know what it feels like to do a marathon in a sense. So, there. <laughs> I'm going to, with time's up, I'm going to wrap this up and bogart. Thank you.